I have so many things to say, and I hope I don't take too long to say them to you. I'm, I'm a writer, and so I've actually written what I want to say for two reasons. One, because I'm sure that you're much more interested in the way I write than in the way I speak. And second, because the things I have to say are complicated, dangerous things in these dangerous times, and I think we have to be very, very precise about what we're saying and how we say them and the language that we use. So I hope it's okay if I read it out to you. My talk today is called Come September. Writers imagine that they cull stories from the world. I'm beginning to believe that vanity makes them think so. That it's actually the other way around. Stories cull writers from the world. Stories reveal themselves to us, the public narrative, the private narrative. They colonize us, they commission us, they insist on being told. Fiction and non-fiction are only different techniques of storytelling. For reasons that I don't fully understand, fiction dances out of me, and non-fiction is wrenched out by the aching, broken world I wake up to every morning. The theme of much of what I write, fiction as well as non-fiction, is the relationship between power and powerlessness, and the endless circular conflict they're engaged in. John Berger, that most wonderful writer, once wrote, never again will a single story be told as though it's the only one. There can never be a single story. There are only ways of seeing. So when I tell a story, I tell it not as an ideologue who wants to pit one absolutist ideology against another, but as a storyteller who wants to share her way of seeing. Though it might appear otherwise, my writing is not really about nations and histories. It's about power, about the paranoia and ruthlessness of power, about the physics of power. I believe that the accumulation of vast, unfettered power by a state or a country, a corporation or an institution, or even an individual, a spouse, a friend, a sibling, regardless of ideology, results in excesses such as the ones I will recount here. Living as I do, as millions of us do, in the shadow of the nuclear holocaust that the governments of India and Pakistan keep promising their brainwashed citizenry, and in the global neighborhood of the war against terror, what President Bush rather biblically calls the task that never ends, I find myself thinking a great deal about the relationship between citizens and the state in India, those of us who have expressed views on nuclear bombs, big dams, corporate globalization, and the rising threat of communal Hindu fascism, views that are at variance with the Indian governments, are branded anti-national. While this accusation doesn't fill me with indignation, it's not an accurate description of what I do or how I think. Because an anti-national is a person who is against his or her own nation and by inference is pro some other one. But it isn't necessary to be anti-national to be deeply suspicious of all nationalism, to be anti-nationalism. Nationalism of one kind or another was the cause of most of the genocide of the 20th century. Flags are bits of colored cloth that governments use first to shrink wrap people's brains and then as ceremonial shrouds to bury the dead. <clears throat> when independent thinking people, and here I do not include the corporate media, begin to rally under flags, when writers, painters, musicians, filmmakers suspend their judgment and blindly yoke their art to the service of the nation, it's time for all of us to sit up and worry. In India, we saw it happen soon after the nuclear tests in 1998 and during the Kargil war against Pakistan in 1999. In the US, we saw it during the Gulf War. And we see it now during the war against terror, that blizzard of made-in-China American flags. <laughs> 
Recently, those who have criticized the actions of the U.S. government, myself included, have been called anti-American. Anti-Americanism is in the process of being consecrated into an ideology. The term anti-American is usually used by the American establishment to discredit and not falsely, but shall we say inaccurately, define its critics. Once someone is branded anti-American, the chances are that he or she will be judged before they are heard, and the argument will be lost in the welter of bruised national pride. But what does the term anti-American mean? Does it mean you're anti-jazz, or that you're opposed to free speech, that you don't delight in Toni Morrison or John Updike, that you have a quarrel with giant sequoias? Does it mean that you don't admire the hundreds of thousands of American citizens who marched against nuclear weapons? or the thousands of war resistors who forced their government to withdraw from Vietnam? Does it mean that you hate all Americans? This sly conflation of America's culture, music, literature, the breathtaking physical beauty of the land, the ordinary pleasures of ordinary people, with criticism <clears throat> of the US government's foreign policy, about which, thanks to America's free press, sadly most Americans know very little is a deliberate and extremely effective strategy. It's like a retreating army taking cover in a heavily populated city, hoping that the prospect of hitting civilian targets will deter enemy fire. But there are many Americans who would be mortified to be associated with their government's policies. The most scholarly, scathing, incisive, hilarious critiques of the hypocrisy and the contradictions in US government policy come from American citizens. When the rest of the world wants to know what the U.S. government is up to, we turn to Noam Chomsky, Edward Said, Howard Zinn, Ed Herman, Amy Goodman, Ma Michael Albert, Chalmers Johnson, William Bloom, and Anthony Arnov to tell us what's really going on. Similarly, Similarly, in India, not hundreds, but millions of us would be ashamed and offended if we were in any way implicated with the present Indian government's fascist policies, which, apart from the perpetration of state terrorism in the Valley of Kashmir in the name of fighting terrorism, have also turned a blind eye to the recent state-supervised pogrom against Muslims in Gujarat. It would be absurd to think that those who criticize the Indian government are anti-Indian, although the government itself never hesitates to take that line. It is dangerous to cede to the Indian government or the American government or anyone for that matter the right to define what India or America are or ought to be. To call someone anti-American, indeed to be anti-American, or for that matter, anti-Indian or anti-Timbuktuan is not just racist, it's a failure of the imagination. An, an inability to see the world in terms other than those the establishment has set out for you. If you're not a Bushi, you're a Taliban. If you don't love us, you hate us. If you're not good, you're evil. If you're not with us, you're with the terrorists. Last year, like many others, I too made the mistake of scoffing at this post-September 11 rhetoric, dismissing it as foolish and arrogant. But I realize that it's not foolish at all. It's actually a canny recruitment drive for a misconceived, dangerous war. Every day I'm taken aback at how many people believe that opposing the war in Afghanistan amounts to supporting terrorism or voting for the Taliban. Now that the initial aim of the war, capturing Osama bin Laden, dead or alive, seems to have run into bad weather, the goalposts have been moved. It's being made out that the whole point of the war was to top topple the Taliban regime and liberate Afghan women from their burqas. We are being asked to believe that the U.S. Marines are actually on a feminist mission. <laughs> If so, if so, will their next stop be America's military ally, Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Think of it this way. In India, there are some pretty reprehensible social practices against untouchables, against Christians and Muslims, against women. 
Pakistan and Bangladesh have even worse ways of dealing with minority communities and women. Should they be bombed? Should Delhi, Islamabad and Dhaka be destroyed? Is it possible to bomb bigotry out of India? Can we bomb our way to a feminist paradise? Is that how women won the vote in the US? Or how slavery was abolished? Can we win redress for the genocide of the millions of Native Americans upon whose corpses the United States was founded by bombing Santa Fe? None of us need anniversaries to remind us of what we cannot forget. So it's no more than coincidence that I happen to be here on American soil in September, this month of dreadful anniversaries. Uppermost on everybody's mind, of course, particularly here in America, is the horror of what has come to be known as 9-11. Nearly 3,000 civilians lost their lives in that lethal terrorist strike. The grief is still deep, the rage still sharp, the tears have not dried, and a strange, deadly war is raging around the world. Yet each person who has lost a loved one surely knows, secretly, deeply, that no war, no act of revenge, no daisy cutters dropped on someone else's loved ones or someone else's children will blunt the edges of their pain or bring their own loved ones back. War cannot avenge those who have died. War is only a brutal desecration of their memory. To fuel yet another war, this time against Iraq, by cynically manipulating people's grief, by packaging it for TV specials sponsored by corporations selling detergent and running shoes is to cheapen and devalue grief, to drain it of meaning. What we are seeing now is a vulgar display of the business of grief, the commerce of grief, the pillaging of even the most private human feelings for political purpose. It is a terrible, violent thing for a state to do to its people. It's not a clever enough subject to speak of from a public platform, but what I would really love to talk to you about is loss, loss and losing, grief, failure, brokenness, numbness, uncertainty, fear, the death of feeling, the death of dreaming, the absolute, relentless, endless, habitual unfairness of the world. What does loss mean to individuals? What does it mean to whole cultures, whole people who have learned to live with it as a constant companion? Since it is September 11th we're talking about, perhaps it's in the fitness of things that we remember what that date means not only to those who lost their loved ones in America last year, but to those in other parts of the world to whom that date has long held significance. This historical dredging is not offered as an accusation or a provocation, but just to share the grief of history, to thin the mist a little, to say to the citizens of America in the gentlest, most human way, welcome to the world. <clears throat> 29 years ago in Chile, on the 11th of September, 1973, General Pinochet overthrew the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende in a CIA-backed coup. Chile should not be allowed to go Marxist just because its people are irresponsible, said Henry Kissinger, Nobel Peace Laureate, then the US Secretary of State. After the coup, President Allende was found dead inside the presidential palace. Whether he was killed or whether he killed himself, we'll never know. In the regime of terror that ensued, thousands of people were killed. Many more simply disappeared. Firing squads conducted public executions. Concentration camps and torture chambers were opened across the country. The dead were buried in mine shafts and unmarked graves. For 17 years, the people of Chile lived in dread of the midnight knock, of routine disappearances, of sudden arrest and torture. Chileans tell the story of how the musician, Victor Jara, had his hands cut off in front of a crowd in the Santiago Stadium. Before they shot him, Pinochet's soldiers threw his guitar at him and mockingly asked him to play. In 1999, following the arrest of General Pinochet in Britain, 
thousands of secret documents were declassified by the U.S. government. They, con they contain unequivocal evidence of the CIA's involvement in the coup, as well as the fact that the U.S. government had detailed information about the situation in Chile during General Pinochet's reign. Yet Kissinger assured the general of his support. <clears throat> in the United States, as you know, we are sympathetic to what you're trying to do, he said. We wish your government well. Those of us who have only ever known life in a democracy, however flawed, would find it hard to imagine what living in a dictatorship and enduring the absolute loss of freedom means. It isn't just those who Pinochet murdered, but the lives he stole from the living that must be accounted for too. Sadly, Chile was not the only country in South America to be singled out for the US government's attentions. Guatemala, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Brazil, Peru, the Dominican Republic, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Honduras, Panama, El Salvador, Peru, Mexico, and Colombia. They've all been the playground for covert and overt operations by the CIA. Hundreds of thousands of Latin Americans have been killed, tortured, or have simply disappeared under the despotic regimes that were propped up in their countries. If this were not humiliation enough, the people of South America have had to bear the cross of being branded as people who are incapable of democracy, as if coups and massacres are somehow encrypted in their genes. This list does not, of course, include countries in Africa or Asia that suffered US military interventions, Vietnam, Korea, Indonesia, Laos, and Cambodia. For how many Septembers, for decades together, have millions of Asian people been bombed and burned and slaughtered? How many Septembers have gone by since August 1945, when hundreds of thousands of ordinary Japanese people were obliterated by the nuclear strikes in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? For how many Septembers have the thousands who had the misfortune of surviving those strikes endured the living hell that was visited on them, their unborn children, their children's children, on the earth, the sky, the water, the wind, and all the creatures that swim and walk and crawl and fly. Not far from here in Albuquerque the national, is the National Atomic Museum, where fat man and little boy, the affectionate nicknames for bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were available as souvenir earrings. Funky young people wore them a massacre dangling in each year. But I'm straying from my theme. It's September that we're talking about, not August. September 11th has a tragic resonance in the Middle East, too. On the 11th of September, 1922, ignoring Arab outrage, the British government proclaimed a mandate in Palestine, a follow-up to the 1917 Balfour Declaration which Imperial Britain issued with its army massed outside the gates of Gaza. The Balfour Declaration promised European Zionists a national home for Jewish people. At the time, the empire on which the sun never set was free to snatch and bequeath national homes like a school bully distributes marbles. How carelessly Imperial power vivisected ancient civilizations. Palestine and Kashmir are Imperial Britain's festering blood-drenched gifts to the modern world. Both are fault lines in the raging international conflicts of today. In 1937, Winston Churchill said of the Palestinians, I quote, I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to the manger, even though he, he may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. That set the trend for the Israeli state's attitude towards Palestinians. In 1969, Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir said, Palestinians do not exist. Her successor, Prime Minister Levi Eshkol said, What are Palestinians? When I came here to Palestine, there were 250,000 
non-Jews, mainly Arabs and Bedouins. It was a desert, more than underdeveloped, nothing. Prime Minister Menachem Begin calls Palestinians two-legged beasts. Prime Minister Yitzhak Shami called them grasshoppers who could be crushed. This is the language of heads of state, not the words of ordinary people. In 1947, the UN formally pa partitioned Palestine and allotted 55% of Palestine's land to the Zionists. Within a year, they had captured 76%. On the 14th of May, 1948, the State of Israel was declared. Minutes after the declaration, the United States recognized Israel. The West Bank was annexed by Jordan. The Gaza Strip came under Egyptian military control, and formally, Palestine ceased to exist except in the minds and hearts of the hundreds of thousands of Palestinian people who became refugees. In 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Over the decades, there have been uprisings, wars, intifadas. Tens of thousands have lost their lives. Accords and treaties have been signed, ceasefires declared and violated. But the bloodshed doesn't end. Palestine still remains illegally occupied. Its people live in inhuman conditions in virtual Bantustans, where they are subjected to collective punishments, 24-hour curfews, where they are humiliated and brutalized on a daily basis. They never know when their homes will be demolished, when their children will be shot, when their precious trees will be cut, when their roads will be closed, when they will be allowed to walk down to the market to buy food and medicine, and when they will not. They live with no semblance of dignity, with not much hope in sight. They have no control over their lands, their security, their movement, their communication, their water supply. So when accords are signed and words like autonomy and even statehood bandied about, it's always worth asking, what sort of autonomy? What sort of state? What sort of rights will its citizens have? Young Palestinians who cannot control their anger turn themselves into human bombs and haunt Israel's streets and public places, blowing themselves up, killing ordinary people, injecting terror into daily life, and eventually hardening both society's suspicion and mutual hatred of each other. Each bombing in invites merciless reprisal and even more hardship on Palestinian people. But then, suicide bombing is an act of individual despair, not a revolutionary tactic. Although Palestinian attacks strike terror into Israeli citizens, they provide the perfect cover for the Israeli government's daily incursions into Palestinian territory, the perfect excuse for old-fashioned 19th century colonialism dressed up as a new-fashioned 20th century war. Israel's staunchest political and military ally is, and always has been, the U.S. The U.S. government has blocked, along with Israel, almost every U.N. resolution that sought a peaceful, equitable solution to the conflict. It has supported almost every war that Israel has fought. When Israel attacks Palestine, it is American missiles that smash through Palestinian homes. And every year, Israel receives several billion dollars from the United States, taxpayers' money. What lessons should we draw from this tragic conflict? Is it really impossible for Jewish people who suffered so cruelly themselves, more cruelly perhaps than any other people in history, to understand the vulnerability and the yearning of those whom they have displaced? Does extreme suffering always kindle cruelty? What hope does this leave the human race with? What will happen to the Palestinian people in the event of a victory? When a nation without a state eventually proclaims a state, what kind of state will it be? What horrors will be perpetrated under its flag? Is it a separate state that we should be fighting for, or the rights to a life of liberty and dignity for everyone, regardless of their ethnicity or religion? Palestine was once a secular bulwark in the Middle East, but now the weak, undemocratic, by all accounts corrupt but avowedly non-sectarian PLO is losing ground to Hamas, which espouses an overtly sectarian ideology and fights in the name of Islam. To quote from their manifesto, 
We will be its soldiers and the firewood of its fire which will burn the enemies. The world is called upon to condemn suicide bombers, but can we ignore the long road they have journeyed on before they arrived at this destination? September 11th, 1922 to September 11th, 2002. 80 years is a long time to have been waging war. Is there some advice the world can give the people of Palestine? Should they just take Golda Meir's suggestion and make a real effort not to exist? In another part of the Middle East, September 11th strikes a more recent chord. It was on the 11th of September, 1990, that George W. Bush Sr., then President of the U.S., made a speech to, to a joint session of Congress announcing his, his government's decision to go to war against Iraq. The U.S. government says that Saddam Hussein is a war criminal, a cruel military despot who has committed genocide against his own people. That's a fairly accurate description of the man. In 1988, Saddam Hussein raised hundreds of villages in northern Iraq and used chemical weapons and machine guns to kill thousands of Kurdish people. Today we know that that same year, the U.S. government provided him with $500 million in subsidies to buy American farm products. The next year, after he had successfully completed his genocidal campaign, the U.S. government doubled its subsidy to $1 billion. It also provided him with high-quality germ seed for anthrax and helicopters and dual-use material that could be used to manufacture chemical and biological weapons. So it turns out that while Saddam Hussein was carrying out his worst atrocities, the US and the UK governments were his close allies. So what changed? In 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. His sin was not so much that he had committed an act of war, but that he had acted independently without orders from his master. This display of independence was enough to upset the power equation in the Gulf. So it was decided that Saddam Hussein be exterminated like a pet that has outlived its owner's affection. The first Allied attack on Iraq took place in January 91. The world watched the primetime war as it was played out on TV. In India those days you had to go to a five-star hotel lobby to watch CNN. Tens of thousands of people were killed in a month of devastating bombing. What many do not know is that the war never ended then. The initial fury simmered down into the longest sustained air attack on a country since the Vietnam War. Over the last decade, American and British forces have fired thousands of missiles and bombs on Iraq. In the decade of economic sanctions that followed the war, Iraqi civilians have been denied food, medicine, hospital equipment, ambulances, clean water, the basic essentials. About half a million Iraqi children have died as a result of the sanctions. Of them, Madeleine Albright, then U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, famously said, it's a very hard choice, but we think the price is worth it. Moral equivalence was the term that was used to deny, denounce those of us who criticized the war on Afghanistan. Madeleine Albright cannot be accused of moral equivalence. What she said was just straightforward algebra. A decade of bombing has not managed to dislodge Saddam Hussein, the beast of Baghdad. Now, almost 12 years on, President George Bush Jr. has ratcheted up the rhetoric once again. He's proposing an all-out war whose goal is nothing short of a regime change. The New York Times says that the Bush administration is, quote, following a meticulously planned strategy to persuade the public, the Congress, and the allies of the need to confront the threat of Saddam Hussein. Andrew H. Card Jr., the White House Chief of Staff, described how the administration was stepping up its war plans for the fall, and I quote, from a marketing point of view, he said, you don't introduce new products in August. This time, the catchphrase for Washington's new product is not the plight of Kuwaiti people, but the assertion that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Forget the feckless moralizing of peace lobbies 
wrote Richard Pearl, a former advisor to President Bush. We need to get him before he gets us. Status of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. And many have said clearly that its arsenal has been dismantled and that it does not have the capacity to build one. However, there is no confusion over the extent and range of America's arsenal of nuclear and chemical weapons. Would the US government welcome weapons inspectors? Would the UK or Israel? What if Iraq does have a nuclear weapon? Does that justify a preemptive US strike? The US has the largest arsenal of nuclear weapons in the world and it's the only country in the world to have actually used them on civilian populations. If the US is justified in launching a preemptive strike on Iraq, why then any nuclear power is justified in carrying out a preemptive strike on any other? India could attack Pakistan or the other way around. If the US government develops a distaste for, say, the Indian Prime Minister, can it just take him out with a preemptive strike? Recently, the United States played an important part in forcing India and Pakistan back from the brink of war. Is it so hard for it to take its own advice? Who is guilty of feckless moralizing, <clears throat> of preaching peace while it wages war? The US, which George Bush has called the most peaceful nation on earth, has been at war with one country or another every year for the last 50 years. Wars are never fought for altruistic reasons. They're usually fought for hegemony, for business. And then, of course, there's the business of war. Protecting its control of the world's oil is fundamental to US foreign policy. The US government's recent military interventions in the Balkans and Central Asia have to do with oil. Hamid Karzai, the puppet president of Afghanistan installed by the US, is said to be a former employee of UNOCAL, the American-based oil company. The US government's paranoid patrolling of the Middle East is because it has two-thirds of the world's oil reserves. Oil keeps America's engines purring sweetly. Oil keeps the free market rolling. Whoever controls the world's oil controls the world's market. And how do you control the oil? <clears throat> Nobody puts it more elegantly than the New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman. In an article called Craziness Pays, he said, quote, the US has to make it clear to Iraq and US allies that America will use force without negotiation, hesitation, or UN approval. His advice was well taken. In the wars against Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as in the almost daily humiliation the US government heaps on the UN. In his book on globalization, the Lexus and the olive tree, Friedman says, and I quote, the hidden hand of the market will never work without the hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonnell Douglas. And the hidden fist that keeps the world safe for Silicon Valley's technologies to flourish is called the US Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps. Perhaps this was written in a moment of vulnerability, but it's certainly the most succinct, accurate description of the project of corporate globalization that I have read. After the 11th of September 2001 and the war against terror, the hidden hand and fist have had their cover blown, and we have a clear view now of America's other weapon, the free market bearing down on the developing world with a clenched, unsmiling smile. The task that ever, never ends is America's perfect war, the perfect vehicle for the endless expansion of American imperialism. In Urdu, the word for profit, as in P-R-O-F-I-T, is faida. Al-Qaeda means the word, the word of God, the law. So in India, some of us call the war against terror Al-Qaeda versus Al-Faida, the word versus the prophet, no pun intended. For, for the moment, it looks as though Al-Faida will carry the day, but then you never know. In the last 10 years of unbridled corporate globalization, the world's total income has increased by an average of 2.5% a year, and yet the number of poor in the world has increased 2.5%. 
by 100 million. Of the top 100 biggest economies, 51 are corporations, not countries. The top 1% of the world has the same combined income as the bottom 57%, and that disparity is growing. And now, under the spreading canopy of the war against terror, this process is being hustled along. The men in suits are in an unseemly hurry. While bombs rain down on us and cruise missiles skid across the skies, while nuclear weapons are stockpiled to make the world a safer place. Contracts are being signed, patents are being registered, oil pipelines are being laid, natural resources are being plundered, water is being privatized, and democracies are being undermined. In a country like India, the structural adjustment end of the corporate globalization project is ripping through pre people's lives. Development projects, massive privatization, and labor reforms are pushing people off their lands and out of their jobs, resulting in a kind of barbaric dispossession that has few parallels in history. Across the world, as the free market brazenly protects Western markets and forces developing countries to lift their trade barriers, the poor are getting poorer and the rich richer. Civil unrest has begun to erupt in the global village. In countries like Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Bolivia, and India, the resistance movements against corporate globalization are growing. To contain them, governments are tightening their control. Protesters are being labeled terrorists and then being dealt with as such. But civil unrest does not only mean marches and demonstrations and protests against globalization. Unfortunately, it also means a desperate downward spiral into crime and chaos and all kinds of despair and disillusionment, which, as we know from history and from what we see unspooling before our eyes, gradually becomes a fertile breeding ground for terrible things, cultural nationalism, religious bigotry, fascism, and, of course, terrorism. All these march arm in arm with corporate globalization. There is a notion gaining credence that the free market breaks down national barriers and that corporate globalization's ultimate destination is a hippie paradise where the heart is the only passport and we all live happily together inside a John Lennon song. <laughs> Imagine there's no country, but this is a canard. What the free market undermines is not national sovereignty, but democracy. As the disparity between the rich and poor grows, the hidden fist has its work cut out for it. Multinational corporations on the prowl for sweetheart deals that, that yield enormous profits cannot push through those deals and in administer those projects in developing countries without the active connivance of state machinery, <clears throat> the police, the courts, sometimes even the army. Today, corporate globalization needs an international confederation of loyal, corrupt, preferably authoritarian governments in poorer countries to push through unpopular reforms and quell the mutinies. It needs a press that pretends to be free. It needs courts that pretend to dispense justice. It needs nuclear bombs, standing armies, sterner immigration laws, and watchful coastal patrols to make sure that it's only money, goods, patents, and services that are being globalized, not the free movement of people, not a respect for human rights, not international treaties on racial discrimination, or chemical and nuclear weapons, or greenhouse gas em emissions, climate change, or, God forbid, justice. It's as though even a gesture towards international accountability would wreck the whole enterprise. Close to one year after the war against terror was officially flagged off in the ruins of Afghanistan, in country after country, freedoms are being curtailed in the name of protecting freedom, civil liberties are being suspended in the name of protecting democracy. All kinds of dissent <clears throat> is being defined as terrorism. All kinds of laws are being passed to deal with it. Osama bin Laden seems to have vanished into thin air. Mullah Omar is supposed to have made his escape on a motorbike. They could have sent Tintin after him. <laughs> the Taliban may have disappeared, 
but their spirit at their system of summary justice is surfacing in the unlikeliest of places, in India, in Pakistan, in Nigeria, in America, in all the Central Asian republics run by all manner of despots, and of course in Afghanistan under the US-backed Northern Alliance. Meanwhile, down at the mall there's a mid-season sale. Everything's discounted, oceans, rivers, oil, gene pools, fig wasps, flowers, childhoods, aluminium factories, phone companies, wisdom, wilderness, civil rights, ecosystems, air, all 4,600 million years of evolution. It's packed, sealed, tagged, valued, and available off the rack. No returns. As for justice, I'm told it's on offer too. You can get the best that money can buy. Donald Rumsfeld said that his mission in the war against terror was to persuade the world that Americans must be allowed to continue their way of life. When, when the maddened king stamps his foot, slaves tremble in their quarters. So standing here today, it's hard for me to say this, but the American way of life is simply not sustainable because it doesn't acknowledge that there is a world beyond America. But fortunately, power has a shelf life. When the time comes, maybe this mighty empire will, like others before it, overreach itself and implode from within. It looks as though structural cracks have already appeared. As the war against terror casts its net wider and wider, America's corporate heart is hemorrhaging. For all the endless, empty chatter about democracy, Today, the world is run by three of the most secretive institutions in the world, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, all three of which, in turn, are dominated by the US. Their decisions are made in secret. The people who head them are appointed behind closed doors. Nobody really knows anything about them, their politics, their beliefs, their intentions. Nobody elected them. Nobody said they could make decisions on our behalf a world run by a handful of greedy bankers and CEOs who nobody elected, can't possibly last. Soviet-style communism failed not because it was intrinsically evil, but because it was flawed. It allowed too few people to usurp too much power. 21st century market capitalism, American style, will fail for the same reasons. Both are edifices constructed by the human intelligence undone by human nature. The time has come, the walrus said. Perhaps things will become worse and then better. Perhaps there's a small god up in heaven readying herself for us. Another world is not only possible, she's on her way. Maybe many of us won't be here to greet her, but on a quiet day, if I listen very carefully, I can hear her breathing. Thank you. Thank you.